welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another exciting extravaganza of an episode of the Vinnie Eastwood Show, broadcasting from New Zealand, the fabulous, the fluoridated, the irradiated. It's just so beautiful, and that is the reason why we get really large quantities of tourist dollars. In fact, even New Zealanders aren't uh, under, under the impression that our country more or less has its largest industry being tourism. You didn't know that, did you, you New Zealanders? You thought we produced milk products and, and, and food and so on and so forth and stuff that actually matters, that allows us to be independent. Sorry to burst that bubble, but we're completely dependent on everybody else coming to New Zealand. So hopefully the Vinnie Eastwood show drives so that they can enjoy the high rad levels. My very special guest is Kevin P. Lawton. The crowdfundingrevolution.com is his website, and he's a bit of an author. Now, this is a subject very, very near and dear to me hearts, as every single one of you regular subscribers and donors would know. Uh, this show is funded by you. And now we're going to interview an author of a book on the subject. I'm quite excited. Kevin, welcome to the program. Hey, Vinny, man. It's great to be here with you. I've, I've listened to a lot of your stuff, and I, I totally enjoyed it, man. I I believe you had some form of quip or, or Buckminster Minster Fuller quote to start off the uh, episode here. I'd love to, man. And I, I'd just like to tell everybody that Buckminster Fuller, I think, probably had the, the best activist mind on earth, and he really gave us some good tidbits, some real pearls of wisdom. And, and so here's one of my favorites from him. If you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying to teach them. Instead, give them a tool, the use of which will lead to new ways of thinking. R.I.P., my, my good friend. He, uh, he, was, he had a lot of other great quotes and a lot of fantastic engineering as well that, that he left us with. But I, I think that we'd be wise to, you know, kind of re, uh, rediscover the man. Did you ever meet him? No, I, I hadn't. Yeah, I think he died in uh, something like, you know, 1983 or so. Uh, oh, well, that was a year before I was even born, son. <laughs> well, we won't talk about me, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's keep that on the down low. Yeah, Kevin, please tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do. All right. Well, I mean, like most people, I was born into an insane asylum and then uh, put through an educational uh, concentration camp known as school when I was younger. And like a lot of creative minds, kind of, you know, realized early on that wasn't. Uh, that wasn't something that made a lot of sense to me, you know, being taught by people, these imposters proposing to be teachers and whatnot. So I guess I was kind of a um, independent thinker and an autodidactic type of person uh, most of my life. And then um, I went on to go get a, what they call an honest job, I guess. I, my first job was MIT Lincoln Laboratory, worked on a bunch of, I guess you could say DOD kind of projects. Um, and then you know, that was a nice place to work, but I had an entrepreneurial mind and um, went off to start off my first startup company. Um, that was kind of a techie thing, but in, in essentially I modeled the whole PC and software. And that software was, was done in a sort of an open source model. Um, it was available on the Internet, and um, that was used to essentially research and develop a lot of the um, virtualization projects out there, VMware and Zen and all these guys. That that's one of the key technologies these days um, in Amazon Cloud. It turns out, so uh, while well, they got the credit, um, it's always it's always the case there was somebody before them. And in this case, that would probably be me. Um, and so I went off to do a startup doing that. And um, fortunately, I had sold the company I was working in. I did that and made it completely open source. And then went on to work for a whole slew of of other startup companies. Um, some of them venture backed, actually. Uh, in aggregate, probably some of the companies I worked on have taken over maybe probably about 250 million total in venture finance. Um, been at early startups in residence at a couple of venture firms and study venture capital and then, you know, and some economics and finance and capital markets and all kinds of stuff. And along that process, especially being independent thinker, it, it really, um, you know, the whole system really abraded me and, and occurred to me that. Boy, this system is broken, man. This doesn't make any sense at all. 
Um, this isn't, you know, funded by people who should be funding it. The wrong companies are getting funded. The way people have to approach people to get funding is wrong. The whole bit was broken. So I started um, blogging, and that blogging sort of converged on a series of um, presentations that I put on SlideShare.net called uh, The New Face of Venture Capital, Parts 1 through 3. And sort of the end result of that, the conclusion is, you know, the, the last slide was a lot about crowdfunding and all the, all the detriments of the current system essentially were, were solved or resolved by, um, you know, at least an advanced form of crowdfunding, a little bit farther than we are now. But that really got me thinking. And so I started exploring, we, why don't we have crowdfunding platforms instead of going to angels and then later venture capitalists? So I started diving into some, you know, the nasties of SEC regulations and, you know, talking to as many people as I could. And it became clear that the answer is because it's absolutely suppressed. The, the entire system is just baked to keep people who are entrenched in the system entrenched and people who aren't out. You know, and that dates in the U.S. centric uh, view anyway, that dates back to 1933, the Securities Act and 34 Exchange Act, where they essentially created a, a, I call it financial apartheid system in the United States, and many of the other countries adopted similar things in the similar time frame. Essentially, it's sort of a template. So you can you can see that template happen in other company countries. More or less, it's a uh, legal framework that doesn't sound totally tyrannical to people uh, looking at it, but it actually is and works quite well in its fashion and its design. Absolutely, man. I mean, they have, they, they literally, when I say apartheid, I'm not really kidding because they literally classify people into two buckets. There's an accredited and non-accredited. And that sounds like you took a degree or some kind of training or what have you. But the truth is accredited just means someone with enough wealth. That's it. And then there's people without it and they're non-accredited or the, you know, proletariat class essentially. And you know, and then they they went uh, even further, essentially along the way, and they made sure that financial advisors could only recommend listed stocks, which to to us really means public stocks. So there you go, right? You can't even have a financial advisor who's very savvy and early phase investing, essentially going out to the general public and saying, "Hey, look, here's a local startup company. You know, it's a organic bakery or something, or a nice little mini farmstead." You know, they can't even. Um, if, if they wanted to, they could not recommend it to you. So they really boxed out people from talking to other people. I mean, it's really nothing more than, a, in the U.S., a First Amendment uh, obliteration, essentially. They just dis disabled people's ability to reach out to their own kind and, and you know, look for financing um, from people who would actually maybe even live next door, for example, you know, God forbid. So it really is an apartheid system, and they, it's worked um, really well for the intended consequence, which seems to be shutting out people. So I started, you know, blogging a lot and talking to people and researching and then hooked up with a guy who was doing, um, you know, he's doing, working on his PhD, and he was really concentrating on crowdfunding. And he saw some of my work online and said, hey, you know, I'm writing this book. Uh, man, some of your thinking is fantastic. Let's, you know, let's write this book together. So I ended up writing being an accidental author and, um, you know, researching and talking and got to know as many people as I could. And oddly enough, um, the uh, people at the Office of Science and Technology at the White House heard about crowdfunding and, hey, this might be something for the uh, economy, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and uh, ended up doing a conference call with them um, about, you know, the whole kind of context of crowdfunding and who would be the next few people to talk with and, then kind of hooked up in the sidelines with some people who were advocating for, you know, getting congressional hearings and, um, you know, just I was really always on the sideline, but a lot of the uh, kind of intellectual thinkings that I put on the table uh, in the book, the blog, and otherwise uh, ended up in some of the uh, written testimony. And um, to, to make a, a long story short, they had a, a really good impact in the, um, in the House with McHenry's bill, which was just fantastic, this really light touch just really opened the doors without a lot of uh, red tape. And then it got passed to the Senate and dirtied up as much as you could imagine, and then got passed as part of a six-pack of things in the, the Job Act. 
uh, legalization of, of crowdfunding, not Kickstarter style for perks and whatnot, but for security. So equity, debt, revenue share, and these kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, they did the classic thing after <laughs> getting a lot of votes from probably from passing that, which is they, they passed it off the SEC to, um, you know, further generate some more red tape pile that no one can work through. And then um, promised to do it within a year, and now it's a couple of years, and we're still waiting. <laughs> still waiting for the finalization for a law that we have where people still, at least the common people, can't, still can't use crowdfunding in a meaningful way. However, one of the other pieces was a, an extension of crowdfunding for accredited investors like angels and whatnot, and uh, they, they finalized on that, and that's working now. So uh, I guess they have to... Work harder to protect the people, in air quotes, of course. And you, uh, so that, that's where we're at. Are you telling me that you've actually helped to put legislation that is now in effect in the United States? I've, um, I've been involved in it. Um, I, I don't think I want to get too much further than that much involvement. Um, at one point, they were actually asked, uh, the friends who, were, who did, uh, you know, they went in front of Congress. They were wondering if I wanted to go for the next round. And I said, you know... The problem is that I have this problem that I tell the truth, and I'm not sure that's the guy you want testifying. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you're right. You know, you probably would have been kicked out of the house or held in contempt or something. This man's telling the truth. Put him in jail. <laughs> yeah, we're all being suppressed. <laughs> Leave the building. Yeah. You know, I don't, I that's don't un-American. Everyone. Fight for freedom. What is he doing about? We, we got. No, we have no history of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. However, the great news out of this whole thing is it did sort of spread. Uh, the idea spreads, you know, um, lighting fires in the in the minds of men, I, so, I suppose. But you know, other countries did their own. My uh, my co-author was had his fingerprints in the uh, Italian version of it, and that that's kind of went through a little bit quicker. And um, maybe it's not the the perfect bill either but at least that you know that kind of lit a fire there and it got other people thinking in different countries about geez you know maybe we should let regular people be involved in creating companies <laughs> as radical as that is and so the the idea is out there and it's available and and frankly any country that that enables it and really really puts you know emphasis on allowing allowing to happen rather than adding red tape i think is going to have a phenomenal economic impact from it can you uh, explain and define exactly what uh crowdfunding is and also what the term open source means sure let's start with open source so i am um i'm old enough it turns out to have been you know involved in open source fairly early so for example hey so is the uh, heinz corporation they know how to open source <laughs> yeah, we'll just uh, skate right past that coming. But um, so, you know, in the, um, in the 80s, I got involved in, in this idea of open source, which is just really collaborative, um, you know, software creation. And what happened is I, I, I really I went to school. I went to college at just the right time when the Internet was really coming online and, you know, we could have these things, these radical things called email and, you know, uh, uh, massive on, online player games and stuff like that going on. But at any rate, um, what had happened was the Internet really opened up the ability for people between schools and then even people outside of schools to start collaborating on, on creating software um, just because they could, to be honest with you. You know, and it's sort of like like any other collaborative environment where birds of a feather flock together and um, people started creating games and tools, utilities and all kinds of stuff together. And, and that sort of blossomed into this, uh, what, what you see now actually running on a, most of the servers in the world, or I should say, yeah, I would say majority of them are running Linux these days, which is a, a whole complex of, of software created in a collaborative environment. So literally on every, in every country, probably in every school, you know, every zip code almost, there's probably someone helping with open source on the earth. And so I um, got involved in that early, and I author of a couple projects there. And uh, so that's kind of open source, and, and that's interesting because before we get to, you know, really in the crowdfunding, I think open source set the stage for sort of a way of thinking and a way of existing uh, that's in, a predecessor to a lot of the, uh, the kind of new emerging models that we've got, crowdfunding. Can, can I interject? 
Yeah. Um, because it seems that uh, via your definition and explanation of what open source is, this is actually the model by which most in the conspiracy movement work together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're open sourcing truth, right? Yeah. You know, you're collaborating over something, and I guess you could even say so that what there's there's the collaborative part, part, and then there's the openness that you know a lot of them people in the truth movement are working in the open. I guess closed source, which would be the commercial software. The analog to your statement would be the uh, you know the Internet stooges that go out there and slam people. You know, anyone that has a any kind of resonance of truth gets some kind of a troll comment. You know about how they, their comments crap or, you know, they don't like the way they look or they have bad hair or something like that. Oh, bro, the, the internet has bigger troll armies than the frickin' Lord of the Rings, bro. <laughs> no kidding, man. See, I think that that's the mistake from the from the uh, the people with positive intent because, see, I, I, and I think we later we'll get into why I think that activism has been kind of lame and how we you need to amp it up. But, oh, it's been compromised to be sure, yeah. Yeah, well, there's no reason why uh, regular people can't be uh, inverse trolls, right? So why not go out there and, and do and pretend to be a troll and then point people to a URL that's supposedly dispelling some, somebody's truth and then turns out to be even more information? Mm. Hey, what's trolls backwards? Slot. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies? Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. If, 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 if you're going out there and you're being slotty online, you have something to be proud about. You're adding value, man. <laughs> so, like, I, I, I think a lot of these things, uh, things that we, you know, we sort of despise them. But on the other hand, a lot of the, a lot of the problem is really that people just haven't thought about turning on its head. Right. So, um, you know, in some ways, open source guys, they um, they had kind of a chip off their shoulder against some of the controlled software and commercial wear. And, you know, they went out and they just made their own their own software. So they well, just they just kind of did it. I just had a conversation um, last night uh, with a guy who is very similar to me. And I think and I think you are, too, in that we've got this. Um, we're not employee men. Okay, you know, we're not very good at being employees, namely because we don't like working for people that are dumber than us. Uh, and we require independence and the ability to create and make things that don't currently exist. Employment opportunities in that regard, with an employer who respects you, who's smarter than you, um, and can allow you all of those freedoms... They're extremely rare, and, and most people like us, either A1, they decide to keep working in a slave job for their entire life, and then when they die, they have a list of regrets, or two, they destroy their life in order to become independent and then build themselves back up from scratch again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the manager that you mentioned that's you know really smart and can deal with people and you really respect it's kind of like finding a two-headed unicorn in some ways and but the um the interesting thing i've noticed is there's you know i've in technology you can't help but work with a lot of um supposedly intelligent people and what happens is they a lot of them you know they know that they're work slaves they it, it's i mean it, it doesn't it doesn't take a genius to realize when you're in a cube you've just you know changed from one kind of prison bars to the other but um they realize it but there's a little bit of this sort of denial complex that people get where, you know, it seems like everybody else is doing this, so it can't be that bad, right? And uh, and so they kind of stay in that grind, and then you realize a little bit when you're older, hey, wait a minute, I've been working, you know, 70 hours a week for how many years and barely taking vacations, and, uh, you know, and, geez, my financial manager tells me I'm going to have to work for another 70 years before I can retire. <laughs> Guess what? There is no retirement, man, <laughs> you know. So it's, um, I'm, I'm it's you, the, uh, what they call the ladder climbing, um, and people are foolish. They, they believe people who are more powerful than them, believing that authority can be trusted, and this, this is a bad idea. Um, what, what did I say? Uh, business is like politics. Foolish people think that they can change that system, that company, that country, etc., from within. This is the big lie. Right. This is how they attract good apples and force yeah. them into the bad barrel. 
there was this fantastic quote from my favorite comedian, uh, the late Bill Hicks. I hope people know who Bill Hicks is. He's my favorite too. In fact, uh, he was probably my broad base awakening to the to becoming a truther in the first place when I was at university all those years ago. Wow, man, what what a coincidence that is, huh? He, you know, he said something. It was this big long spiel, but at the end, he said, uh, "You know, people, the the reason why the systems around us are failing us is because they're no longer relevant." You know, evolution did not stop when we acquired opposable thumbs. You know that, right? <laughs> and it, I mean, I, I really, that the impact of that statement is, it's, there's so much analysis of that in one, one comic routine, right? Where, and, and it's just what you said, people are fighting, like uh, another Buckminster quote about, you don't change things fighting the existing reality. You change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's that's exactly what a lot of these uh, alternative socioeconomic paradigms that you know, I've been looking into are, are doing. And it's what we did in open source. It's to some extent what crowdfunding is about. And um, going forward, I think the the real new, you know, I, I wrote the series New Face of Venture Capital. The new face of activism, I think, is exactly obeying the thinking uh at least letting it resonate with you what you said that you know let's not let's not get inside and try to change stuff it's like trying to change somebody you know like trying to change a person you know my, my mom told me when i was younger you'll you'll never you'll never teach anyone anything they can only learn it and you know trying to change somebody is sort of like that it's like pushing up against a brick wall and so i'm really happy when people just finally get so disgusted trying to change stuff that they think hey well let's just create something else you know yeah. And uh, there's a lot to talk about that in this conversation about, you know, upcoming uh, models and what, you know, what we can do in, in activism and, and so forth. Mm. It's like freaking Sinatra. I did it my way. <laughs> you have to, there's a certain personality trait that helps you kind of be that way too, right? Where, like, I think I was born iconoclastic, you know, I, I think I, there was a button and I have to go push it. And, you know, if, if somebody's all kind of, um, you know, arrogant about, you know, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm a manager, I'm running something. It's almost like you want to go up and kind of poke them in the eye just for being a douche. And um, so I think the curse I, is being intelligent enough to realize how stupid everyone else is. <laughs> there's some truth in that man <laughs> but you know it's um it's interesting part of my my sense of activism anyway is um i've i've kind of found i've found as many ways as possible that did not work activating people um just by accident like trying this trying that and realizing none of this crap's working right and i i created this this phrase i call it thought bomb you know you it's like if you someone's in a foxhole right and you're shooting bullets over the head they'll just duck and they'll entrench in their foxhole even deeper they're not coming out man those bullets whizzing over well you can talk about chemtrails or banksters or whatever right gmo food it's just like more bullets over them but you throw a you throw a thought grenade in their foxhole they're coming out and sometimes you know it's not just about intellect but that that the way that someone's being approached doesn't flush them out. You have to really, really give someone a reason to jump out of their foxhole. <laughs> and, and so I think, I think some of the people who are kind of outside the system have to think with higher leverage in terms of activating people. And we Considering can, we can, activation, I, um, I I don't think that it's it's possible to do it kind of like this gently gently approach that people are talking about. You know, like oh, right. you've got to present the information in a way that's acceptable and palatable and blah 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 blah. Dude, I'm not the mainstream media. Okay, I am <laughs> going to destroy your brain by giving you a bullet of information to the head, and you will <laughs> and you it will take you a long time to heal from that injury. Same as everybody else. It's not pleasant. <laughs> Sorry, man, but I just JFK'd the old you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely, man. That's that's how it's got to be done, and it it seems almost cruel, at, you know, to, at some levels. But it's even crueler letting somebody, in my opinion, live in an, in a, an old paradigm that's gonna you know end in their demise anyway. And so there, are, and I've you know I've started to explore and find ways that that are a lot better. 
at activating. Like, for example, I was at a, a local town meeting here around the Mountain View area. I'm in Silicon Valley or Silicon Valley, as I like to call it, for those who don't know the area. And, um, you know, there were some people talking about how, um, geez, you know, the, the zoning commission's going to, like, ban living in these zones and they're going to make public transit down this big corridor, you know, this El Camino Real is going to be converted to, like, I don't know, the grand something or other. And, and it, it, you know, it just rings of Agenda 21 kind of stuff. And so I'm listening to them and they're like, yeah, let's get together and have a neighborhood meeting. And I go there and they're all talking about it and no one has a clue what's going on. And I said, you know, I, I just want to check. Do you guys know about Agenda 21? Because that's what's, what's going on here. And they're like, Agenda 21, what's that? You know, and I said, well, here's the deal. You know, it's, you should just first, you should learn about it and it'll explain what's going on. Of course, none of that worked, right? People aren't going to go learning about, about anything. Uh, you know, it's like, well, hey, I don't know that. It must not be that. If I didn't hear it in, you know, Fox News or CNN, it can't be that important. I love that. If I didn't, haven't heard about it before, it doesn't exist. Like, yeah, bro, bro, yeah. when was the last yeah. time you learned something new in your life? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're coming to break right now. Uh, Kevin, we'll be right back, folks. This episode is sponsored by uh, Blue Shield, but also, uh, more specifically, uh, uh, Kevin's novel, which you can purchase off the vinnyeastwoodshow.com the crowdfunding revolution check it out and we'll be right back welcome back ladies and gentlemen my very special guest is still author kevin lawton the author of the crowdfunding revolution at the crowdfundingrevolution.com you can see a link to his book on the homepage, the vinnyeastwoodshow.com. Bear in mind, uh, we do we do take now a little bit of advertising revenue. So if you have a small business or a book or something like that, you want to promote, just approach me, throw some money at me, you know, just like just like everybody else. Um, so yeah, this this show is still, by the way, vastly mostly funded just by listener subscriptions and donations. So don't think because we've got a few little uh, banners and ads on the website that it's uh, capable of paying for rent, power, fuel, and everything else that you need to do to pay for, to expose scumbaggery and attend protests and interview people and all of that kind of stuff. It's just not enough. And we would love to have resources, you know, so you can help people. There's two types of people that try to accumulate resources. One that try to accumulate it all for themselves so that they can help only themselves. And the others who try to accumulate resources for themselves so that they can help other people. Okay? I'm the latter. <laughs> believe me. And if you don't believe me, I can show you lots of evidence. Interviews for years and years and years. It'll literally take you... At least two years solid of viewing exclusively my content before you could get through half of it. I'm not kidding. <laughs> There's that much. I've done a lot of work and helped a lot of people get their word out. So if you want to help me continue to do that, please go to the com and uh, click donate or subscribe uh, for a couple of dollars a month, whether through PayPal or preferably the Kiwi Bank, because PayPal takes a percentage. Kevin, welcome back. All right, man. It's good to be back. Now, where were we um, when we uh, just broke off that last segment there? I was talking about the situation that uh, some people from local uh, community were trying to, you know, trying to kind of push back against some development plans that sound a lot like Agenda 21 and, and activism and how, you know, people tend to like to think that, hey, if I haven't heard about it before, it can't be that important. And uh, I, 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 I realized after the fact, instead of um, informing people with just a, you know, kind of general bullet points on a, on a, you know, PowerPoint presentation type of thing, even though it was really just verbal, I realized, you know, there are a lot better ways to kind of shake people loose of their thinking. And so then I realized, you know, next time I have a meeting, I think I'm going to hire a couple guys dress up in bankster suits and with sunglasses, the whole lot, and just show up and quietly mill around people will be like really suspicious who are these people I like that I have a banks to suit and sunglasses do you know that would be great you know if you're out this way uh, let's get you activating man because I was thinking we could we could tell them hey look if someone asks you what are you guys doing here you know you say you know uh, let's just say that we represent the banking industry and we we want to see how easy it is it's going to be to take your land 
<laughs> and then and then quietly after stirring around and then just saying a few things just quietly leave and then what will happen is people will be you know the thing is honestly when groups of people get together um you know we could call it activism i think a lot of it's voyeurism i think people just like to be around other people talking about something happening yeah. you know and you know it's and honestly activism is really reactivism people are just reacting to stuff anyway and so well, I think, I think what there's, we need- there's the two elements here. There's activism and entrepreneurism. One uh, kind of holds back the progress of those who want to hold back the uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and one creates new stuff for the activists to oppose. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of dynamics going on and that, that might even segue in a little bit into uh you know my thoughts about crowdfunding and venture capital and in a lot of the I, I like to go and dispel a lot of belief systems one of them is venture capital and why that that why that's supposedly so fantastic um and i mean we could talk about a lot of stuff but that, that's a great uh segue into that actually well by all means regale yeah, me. so, so in a lot of, lot of ways, when I talked about the uh, Securities Act and 3334 kind of boxing people out, creating this apartheid system, really what that did when regular people couldn't fund each other for their small businesses and whatnot was would it put the, the control into the hands of a few people who could acquire pools of money. Mentor guys generally, um, they just actually get their money from somebody else. They're an indirect investor, so they get money from insurance trust and – Kelpers, you know, these kind of retirement funds, whatnot. And um, so because they're, you know, considered accredited investors or people with their own their own net worth or accredited investors, then it really consolidated down into fewer and fewer hands. And then the venture capital industry really blossomed because there was nothing else. I mean, banks don't lend money to high volatility uh, seed stage funded startup companies. It's just not what they do. You know, revenue, no product, no clue. Um, so essentially the venture capital industry is a byproduct in a lot of way, a lot of ways off of the, uh, suppression that happened in the early thirties in the U S and a little bit later in other countries. And you have, you know, you have these people, these MBAs and spreadsheet jockeys and all that wearing suits. Um, I, you know, I call them circus monkeys, but we'll call them venture capitals, capitalists. And they, you know, run around being self-important and, drive their hot cars and stuff like that. The end of the day, these guys are the least uh, venturesome people on earth. They are nothing but cherry pickers. Um, angel investors are a little bit better, but venture capitalists, the way they really work these days, they used to do a little bit uh, more aggressive investing, but they pretty much run around waiting until a deal is obvious. They got a, lot, a whole bunch of users or some lineup of products, revenue, what have you, a lot of traction, as they like to say. And they find ones that are so obvious that they just all pile in and try to be the one to invest in that particular deal. And, I mean, just to kind of, you know, to to sort of summarize things here, obviously we're putting everybody in a bucket, but, and at the end of the day, only a few percent of the venture capital firms really make outsized returns. A lot of them make very little, nothing, or a lot of them lose money. They're, they're really an awful investment for most of the limited partners. And, um, and when you talk to these guys, you realize really quickly that there's nothing about venture and venture capital. It's all about cherry picking. So that my, my favorite cherry picking analogy is like if there's a tree, a lot of cherries, luscious cherries dangling off, people come and they pick the bottom layers and then maybe they stretch out a little bit, pick the upper layers. But the ones at the top, the, you know, the, the people with the tall step ladders get to them. And that's really just the brand affinity that a lot of these, you know, famous venture capitalists have. They have a network and peop- they're the go to VCs because, hey, you know, everyone else knows that Sequoia is a great venture capital firm, blah, blah, blah. That's the stepladder, man. Other than that, venture capital is really, really not a good model. Um, and I'll, I'll go into that a lot, actually, um, as much as you guys like to hear, because um, it's really important for people to understand that while people are worshiping these guys, it, I mean, there's an entire cult of entrepreneurs who just worship the brand name venture capitalist. It's really not a good model. And um, one of my, my favorite points to make, and this really will be a great segue later in the crowdfunding, is this. If you want to find those really, those big outlier 
um, ideas that turn into the next Google, Facebook, or whatever, um, Tesla electric car, what have you, you need access to a huge amount of data points, meaning a lot of potential deals. So you need an enormous volume of potential deals and then an ability to, to sift through those deals. And I, I just boil it down to call it synthesis. You need synthesis. That's what a large crowd does. And if we look to how the crowd has done synthesis at finding outliers or predicting outcomes across the board, like predicting uh, what the next what the box office receipts or the presidential election or you know some weather event or whatever uh, internally at companies they call decision markets they use a what are called a prediction market externally, but internally a a decision market to use the entire knowledge base of all the employees in a company to actually predict an outcome or make a decision. And it turns out time after time that these mechanisms uh, surpass the ability of any expert panel or any hierarchy of management to make decisions or predict outcomes every time by big margins. Like they're 90 something percent accurate. They even predict at um, Innocentive did a great study. There's a company that does this sort of crowdsourced uh, decision market. They have a thing where they realized um, in pharmaceutical companies, when they're going through the various uh, stages of trials, that the, the, the employees could actually predict which drugs would go from one stage to the next, whereas the management had the worst time predicting. <laughs> and um, so, that same mechanism is exactly what crowdfunding is. It's a giant synthesis market with huge amounts of input and a lot of sorting capacity. And by the way, nothing democratic about the synthesis. And that's the important part. You need to really identify outliers. You need outlier identifiers. So you need to weight people's decisions based on their, for example, their past ability to predict something. Uh, predict an uh, event or to be able to solve a problem, you That's have an true. enormous... You need right. outliers, uh, but also you need to kick out actual liars from your <laughs> Yeah, and you can find those with outliers. That's the beauty is you can find charlatans. And and uh, there was interesting, it was I go to these crowdfunding conferences and people are talking about regulation, you know, we got to protect the people, right? One of the biggest mind screws ever. <laughs> I love I love that, you know. Uh, oh, 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 oh. In fact, that reminds me, I just saw a Morgan Freeman post that is brilliant. Oh, Let yeah. me see if I've got this correct. You believe people can't govern themselves, but you believe some people can govern hundreds of millions of other people? <laughs> <laughs> That's... Kind of like in, uh, I think it was 1984, the Orwell book, where there was that saying uh, on the barn, you know, all animals are created equal, but some animals are created more equal. Animal Farm. Animal Farm. Written by you. George Orwell, who also wrote 1984. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, sort of in the same vein, man. Um, and, and actually, that's basically, you could say that about venture capitalists, you know, they're the... Uh, you know, the slightly smarter or better animals or more equal animals. I love it how they have the same uh, 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 letters starting it as vulture capitalists, uh, that, that you can't make the stuff up. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people call them that. I, I like to call them circus monkeys, but um, I, I hate to, you know, say bad things about vultures. But um, it hey, actually, hey, actually, do you know why vultures uh, never have much luggage when they go on commercial flights? Why is that, man? Because they prefer carrion. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> you just come up with this stuff real time, huh? Yeah. So, it's, you know, a, here's, it's an incredibly worthless skill. Like, you know how some people are really good at something that is absolutely useless? <laughs> <laughs> like remembering the trivia tidbits and whatnot? Yeah. Hey. You spend your it, entire I, life doing I'm sorry. I'm going to shut up now. Continue. No, it's probably why you're still sane, though, at the end of the day. So I'm sure there's a lot of use to it. Well, you've got to laugh at the insanity. Otherwise, you join it. Absolutely, man. I was... Um, I was at a, uh, they have these panels, so they have these networking events around here, um, and they had a panel of, of venture capitalists and maybe an angel investor on stage, you know, talking whatever smack about the industry. And uh, they got to the Q&A, 
And I'm, I'm like your worst nightmare if you give me the microphone. I, I'm always the guy at every conference asking the, you know, the one-inch punch questions that no one want to get hit with. And so I get up and I ask, um, I said, you know, you guys are in the, the business of in- financing innovation. Can you tell me the last innovation in venture capitalism? And there was this large, uncomfortable pause in the room. Like no one said anything. And then one guy, I think he was an angel actually, sheepishly admitted, well, we're really not that innovative of, of a kind of people. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure how I got into that. But anyway, that was a nice little, little story to give you an idea that we've got people, vulture capitalists, you know, funding uh, – people without having a clue about how to innovate in their own their own field you know mm. well I, I think this is actually uh, brings upon an important point um my, my former producer uh once told me that people bring three elements to the deal talent resources or capital would you agree with that um, well, those are three components you can bring to a deal for sure hopefully people bring you know some other some other uh, components, right? Some people bring the, their sort of, I guess you could call it a resource, but they're sort of their network. And some people are good at uh, ideating and shaping ideas and some good, good marketing and graphics design and all these kind of things. But it's a general rule. That's sort of a, a good place to start what you mentioned. And, we, you know, at some point too, we could get into, I have some, uh, you know, some pretty interesting thoughts on, on Bitcoin and, and money and uh, some other things like credibility networks that very few people are really talking about out there. So uh, whenever you'd like, we can kind of vector into some of those topics. By all means, proceed. Yeah. So Bitcoin in the whole alt, you know, alt currency space, obviously that's been, that's really exploded over the last year. And, you know, I, I, I fear that people have got kind of roped into, um, a really, a really uh, poor design. A really kind of it, it, uh, there's there's an element of, of Bitcoin and friends that is is really good in the sense that it inspires people to think there's something else. And so for that, I give it an enormous amount of credit. It's just that I hate when people vector their energy into something new and it's kind of just as crappy or nearly as crappy as where they came from. And that's the way I feel about Bitcoin. So. Um, one of my big issues about the whole this whole Bitcoin situation is, or all these all these altcoins really, is if you think about like think about money in general, one of the big problems in my opinion is money is we have this thing I call dynasty, and that is the people that were in the system b- before who were able to to lever it and you know use it to their advantage they accumulated. They accumulated more money. They accumulated this dynasty, the ability to to use that money to then get more money, you know, whether they're investors or what have you. And you could think about as money or resources or whatever. And then it comes along a young generation that starts out with nothing. In fact, they start out in debt, you know, visa cards and student bills and all these kinds of things, really indentured servants. And they have the opposite of dynasty, right? They have no leverage whatsoever, even though they probably have the most capacity to generate something interesting in the future. And so they're starting out negative money. And and in in a lot of ways, that accumulation of dynasty leads to more accumulation of it because once people have it, they just can't get enough of it. And they, and uh, at least a lot of, a lot of people in that position. And so then they use it to their advantage and they go around and do things like buy up politicians and, other kind of you know other kinds of peoples, other police judge or what have you, and they do more and more sketchy things to accumulate more dynasty. So then, they, as, in a relative scale, the common people have less and less, and we we have unfortunately got caught in a system where we worship fake, you know, electronic digits these days in some bank account of some person who accumulated these digits from somebody else, generally through some form of usury. And it's really an unfortunate model. And then what we did with uh, Bitcoin and friends is we recreated that. It's just a different set of people have the digits. And actually there's only so, you know, some gamers and people like this accumulated Bitcoin early. Good for them. I don't have any problem with that. But honestly, there's a lot of rich people now that own a big chunks of Bitcoin. And so you have actually 
really like, you know, 100, 200 people who own a good chunk of Bitcoin. That's dynasty already, and it's fairly young as, a, as an idea. And then it turns out that the amount, there's only, you know, 10 or 20 exchanges of Bitcoin that really handle uh, most of the traffic, and the same for the people that are, are mining, big companies that are doing the mining. So you have hardware dynasty, exchange dynasty, and currency dynasty all in one within just a small amount of years. And, you know, I, I'd really like to send the message out to people that um, if someone really wants to create a, the currency of the future, then make a currency so it's people sourced. So that by virtue of being alive, you actually get allocated units of currency. And on top of that, not on a, not on a basis of one time. I mean, there was a, a Spanish coin and a, um, a currency in Iceland they tried to do this with, where they did a one-time allocation across everybody who was essentially a citizen. That sounds great, but then what happens for the people who were born right after that? They, they're locked into this feudalism or the serfdom because some people before them have this dynasty. So if we really want to honor the rights of people, we have to make the, the money creation continuous and into everybody, source people as the way of creating money rather than lending it through a bank, and then let people mu- spend and invest it. And I've got a, a blog post on, my, on the crowdfundingrevolution.com about this kind of new model. I'm, I'm interested in um, talking with anybody who's, who would like to actually do it. I, I don't have the time myself, but... Um, I think this would be a more interesting model that would be a great stepping stone between where we are and where we could go such that um, we would actually honor people's existence instead of, you know, starting off as a feudal slave. Um, so that's, that's a kind of overview of some of the, you know, critiques I have. I'm, obviously, there are other issues like Bitcoin has a huge, not a huge, but a, a fairly lengthy sign-off time. Um, and what that does is the following. If if you're doing an exchange online through Bitcoin, generally a lot of vendors, they're really taking the Bitcoin and doing uh, an exchange, maybe bit using BitPay or other, to go from Bitcoin to cash. And in a long, uh, like even if you wait 15, 20 minutes to sign off, what that does is that actually maps into um, volatility of the price, which has to get absorbed by the people doing the crossing the, the currency grid as a fee, essentially. So by way of having a long long sign off time you have you end, end you end up jacking up the fee essentially and then it it sort of moots some of the point about how bitcoin's better than some of the other payment services because of lower fees and whatnot so uh, you know there's some issues there and then in bitcoin itself has a problem where people are uh people are mining it on special purpose to processors essentially and what that does is it means that you need quite a bit of money to get a, a current device to be able to mine competitively. And in fact, every month you need to go throw that away or sell it on eBay and get a different one. And it becomes a hardware arms race. And what happens is fewer and fewer people are able to keep up with the arms race. And so at the end, guess what? A few people own most of the mining equipment. Yeah, and not to mention the banks own both sides of all of those operations anyway because Absolutely. they couldn't have even started those operations without the vulture capitalists from the international banks who can make money out of thin air to process in the first place. Absolutely, man. And then you think about it. If, you could, if you're a bankster and you can print money out of thin air at will, you could just pretty much mop up you could just can you know distort, uh, smack down, smack up the price of whatever these alt currencies. They're, they're tiny. The, the total market cap of all the alt currencies, I think, is twenty billion or something like that. I mean, you could just mop up whatever you wanted and own a big chunk, and then swing the price around. You know, you could just send it into oblivion, making people pay big fees with the volatility and, and so forth. So, it's really not a good model. It's, it's not a well-thought-out model. It's, it's not that I blame somebody because they probably weren't even thinking about really doing it, using it on a wide, wide scale like it is today. But I'm just making the point that don't get stuck in thinking that Bitcoin is the ultimate future. It's not. It's not even close. And it's that, you know, it has a public ledger. Uh, police have said they love Bitcoin because it leaves such a forensic trail that it makes it easy for them to trace money, whereas cash is hard to trace. So... Um, don't don't get wrapped up in that that kind of thinking. There's some there are far better models, and I hope that 
you know, people investigate some of them. See, I've always avoided uh, Bitcoin and, and, and what have you. I'm just using uh, kind of uh, PayPal at the moment. And they, they're, they're kind of like uh, perhaps an evil scum uh, corporations or whatever. But I'm a fan of if you can use an evil person's resources to accomplish good ends, then it's all right. Hey, yeah, God's truth is still truth, man, everywhere it goes. So absolutely, use um, use whatever you've got. Yeah, I mean, like, like if you were to break the law and uh, let's say, I don't know, hack into uh, David Rockefeller's personal checking account and steal $100 million, and then you give that $100 million to, uh, uh, let's say, a mil- 100 different conspiracy theorists who have already got really good radio shows and YouTube channels and so on, and they go, here you go, guys, here's a boost, you're all Rockefeller funded now. Would everybody refuse the money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I hate to encourage that publicly, uh, <laughs> but it's an interesting idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you, man. I mean, I think um, it, pure, the, there's a real problem I have with purism. Uh, so many people get wrapped up uh, with trying to stay completely pure and then end up being completely ineffective. All right. I mean, it's it's. Oh my God! You, you just described uh, you just described half the conspiracy movement, bro. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, but you know what? At the end of the day, I think a lot of um, the, you know, isn't it the case in in history? And I hope going forward, anyway, that a, a lot of the real meaningful uh, movements and things that have been done in the world are done by small groups of people. And so, you know, there are a lot of people that are just along for the ride, or really, you know, kind of wrapped up in, in their own little thought bubble they got going on. It, it doesn't really matter that much, you know. I mean, some people do get kind of a little too purist in the activism uh, category. But it's for, you know, here's my great analogy. You know, people, we all love to, um, inc- myself included, berate the sheeple of the world. But at the end of the day, I fun. think that, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's good, clean fun, right? The, the sheeple are probably going to be, the shining uh, light in the end. And here's the reason I say it because, you know, think if, if guys like us are sheep dogs and there's a herd of sheep and on the other side is these wolves, right? You know, they're the banksters and all these kind of bad guys, you know, the, the sheep, they're, they're just sheep, man. They're going to do what sheep will do. And the, the real strategy here is in the minds of the sheep dogs. Right. If the if the if the sheep dogs activate the flock in the right direction, man, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where the what's going on with those wolves. They're going to get run over. And so, like, sometimes I think that the real problem with with, you know, active activizing people is really in the minds of the few people who actually are kind of have enough perspective to see a, a, the bigger picture but are not using high leverage to, to activate people. They're not doing the, the right kind of activism. They're making all the mistakes I did over the years of, you know, trying to tell people the truth and information and, you know, all these kind of root things. <laughs> I, I love, I love those, uh, those naive mistakes. I'll go out and tell people the truth and they'll believe me because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, where did I, so dumb. Oh, where did like, I get that idea? I mean, I mean, that you, I thought the universe had justice and and logic and reason. <laughs> oh wait, no, actually, it's completely mad. And, uh, and and that old adage that these in an insane world, a sane man must appear insane, is certainly true. Kevin Lawton, the author of the crowdfunding revolution. Uh, uh, links to the book on the homepage of the Vinnie Eastwood Show dot com. There also his website, the Crowdfunding Revolution dot com. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It is now hour number two of the fastest two hours in talk radio. It's the Vinnie Eastwood Show. My very special guest in this episode is sponsor Kevin Lawton from the Crowdfunding Revolution dot com. Now we were talking um, over the break about uh, uh, smarmy, uh, hubris-filled people. And and uh, I wanted to actually have a discussion about this because it, it, it's, it's one of those natural elements uh, that you will encounter when you talk about things that are outside of the mainstream. I mean, anybody can talk about American Idol or X Factor and uh, uh, America's Got Talent and uh, any other uh, uh, mainstream... Uh, distraction that you 
criticized or attacked or called an idiot uh, uh, for only consuming that content and never thinking for yourself in the main. However, if you do the opposite and you choose to talk about things that matter, all those people who spend their entire life obsessed with things that don't matter will insult you, will fire you from your job, will report you as suspicious activity and things like this. And it reminds me of the Matrix training program with the woman with the red dress. You're looking at the woman with the red dress, you're looking at the woman with the red dress, suddenly she's gone and there's an agent right there with a gun in your face. Training program's there to uh, teach you one thing, ladies and gentlemen, you are either unplugged, like one of us, or you are potentially an agent of the system. Kevin, welcome back. All right, it's great to be back again. How do you like that analogy I just throw out there? Well, unfortunately, it's kind of valid. <laughs> you see it everywhere, right? Everyone runs into that in the truth moment, spending all their energy and dissipating it into people who pretty much just kind of vampire the energy out of people with good intent. So it's one of the one of the big uh, lessons of the universe people need to learn, right, is to either how to deal with those people or how to not, how to just... Um, you know, bug out essentially. Don't let them. Peop- don't let the people vampire your energy, and and also like it's great practice too, though, because some of these people they come with the, come out with these smarmy comments about how you must be, you know, crazy and idiotic. And um, if you want to practice your ability to create and throw thought grenades into their foxhole, there's there's some good people to do it with. And uh, if you can figure out how to you know how to frag those people to you know and just really obliterate them in front of people then uh i think you're off to a good start what's ironic is that they're not bright enough to realize that they're being obliterated and they're not honest enough to admit when they're wrong <laughs> if the, anything it, you could the best you can hope for is to outnumber them in a bullying sense of the word um I, I don't mean that in a bad way i mean this is just what i what i've discovered you can't win a conversation with somebody like that okay you can only um, what, what was it Mark Twain said? He says, never argue with somebody who is an, an idiot because they will beat you with their experience. <laughs> right, yeah. Something equivalent was uh, never uh, never argue with the crazy people because it's, it's hard for people outside to differentiate who is who. <laughs> hey, so, oh my God, that's actually a really good quote as well because I, I see people um, – like myself arguing with people who are say like for example chemtrail deniers and then you have these third parties who come in and say that they don't want to look at what either me or the chemtrail denier is saying because the mere fact that we're having an argument over something is a put off that creates mm-hmm. confusion that prevents people wanting to investigate further and figure out what's actually going on because they don't know who to believe because they refuse to look at any of the evidence and make their own decision and their own thoughts about it. Yeah, you know, this actually is this is really interesting topic to me because I have this this um idea I call the one step activism. And the the idea here is that look, you know, if you were if you just ask somebody, you know, take this step one one foot of distance, you know, ah, oh, that's no problem. Well, how about three feet? Uh, maybe not too problem. Well, I'll take this Olympic size jump, you know, do twenty seven feet, whatever. That's not gonna happen. And they're not gonna expend the energy to even try. You got, I think the, one of the, the critical pieces for activists, they have to realize that people are only going to take that one simple step. And so really the, the, the key is to find out where is someone in the scheme of things? You know, what's their level of consciousness? What are they aware about? And then just give them one little thing. And maybe not even in the direction of pure information, but sometimes just really kind of like, – do you watch these, uh, these movies, um, Yes Men? where these guys spook oh, yeah. conferences. You can kind of be a yes man type. Like if someone's, you know, doesn't believe about chemtrails, then you just you 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 say, you know, um are your kids involved in that uh that chemtrail drawing contest? I heard you can win like a scholarship. You know, and they're like, What? What? Yeah, whoever can draw the most beautiful chemtrails, you know? And they're like, what are chemtrails? Oh, it's just these, you know, just these uh things left behind by by planes, you know. And then, and then you go, and then you know, you start talking to him about it, and you realize, well, let me send you some photos of chemtrails, and of course, you send him some links from some chemtrail conspiracy site or something. 
See, the thing is to get them involved without saying no or reacting first, and then let them actually go find it. It's it's kind of an it, it sort of goes back to the way I opened with the uh, Buckminster Fuller about you know forget trying to teach somebody just give them a tool and that'll lead to a new way of thinking. May I and offer I'll, some uh, something supplementary to this? Um, uh, what was her name? Doctor Rima Labor from the Doctor Rima Truth Reports dot com. Um, I told her once that you know you, you need uh, to tell people a certain amount of time, and she actually corrected me and gave me the actual number. It takes seven people to tell you this exact same thing, seven different people, mind you, hmm. before you will abandon a, a really strongly held belief, right? So it occurred to me, I have to play my part. If I see a mother with her child's head next to an iPad with wireless signals shooting through its brain, and I go up and say to her, excuse me, you do realize that's dangerous for your baby. And she goes, bugger off, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist. I'll, I'll, mm. um, uh, I'll just go, okay, no problem. I hope six other people tell you the same thing I did and that you wake up. But there's a, part, there's a chance. There's just, yeah. there's, just a, there's just a little chance that I might be that seventh person. And there is a certainty, an absolute certainty, that if myself... And all of us don't say anything to her that there will never be a seventh person. Absolutely. And you never know if you're number two or three or what have you. So, so the, Actually, the, the answer is just play your part, ladies and gentlemen. Do it. Do it, yeah. And, you know, it, it, interesting, um, that, that, that brings up a, a, another way of using high leverage as activism where – if you're, instead of going out in protest, maybe you should just get seven people together and come in at different times and tell some storefront owner about X, Y, or Z, you know, either going to take your property or, you know, going to raise your tax. If you did that, you could actually play that seven person thing on them by having seven what seemingly randomly people, uh, you know, tell them the same thing. <laughs> I'll have to think about that for uh, future activism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They would go with my bankster outfit thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, if if every one of the events there's a couple new banksters coming and telling them, hey, you know, I'm gonna, it's no problem, man. I'm gonna end up buying after we bulldoze your property. We're gonna buy it up, man. Ten cents on the dollar. Yes, if enough bankster looking people tell somebody that, they might actually believe it. You know, it'd be great to actually go to like city council meetings or congressional hearings or, or, or public meetings and things like that where the officials are actually sitting there laying out economic policy, you know, trying to woo the crowd and what have you. And then you just stand up and you ask questions and pretend to be one of these banks to scum and you just say, excuse me, sir, I love your legislation because it'll allow me to invest in this country and, and take most of its strategic assets for pennies on the dollar. <laughs> I believe that you, sir, are going to be a great leader for New Zealand. You know, that kind, that kind of thing. Just Absolutely. encourage them to, to steal and destroy the country and, and act like it's a good thing. Um, but, but use real words. You know, don't use these smarmy BS, oh, oh, we're going to create jobs kind of stuff. Just, just really get in there and, 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 and go, for, go for the jugular. Absolutely. I, I think people should do this. They should amp it up a little bit, amp up the game, you know. I mean, it's, you know, it's... Um, it's interesting how much people the, – the, one of the problems, obviously, we've been inundated, inundated our entire life with a bunch of pseudoscience and pseudo-everything. Um, and, you know, pe so many people are obviously acting within that system that it's hard for other people to, to stretch a little, you know, stretch away from that model because, hey, everyone's doing it. And, you know, if I jump outside that, I look like a freak, whatever. But, you know, even in, um, even in finance, so you mentioned the banksters and all that. I mean, I've met – so I was thinking about taking a, a, an MBA at some point, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't wrap my mind around uh, learning something from, you know, force-fed, foie-gras-type pseudoscience from people who are teaching me, you know, about something that's like 50, 100-year-old thinking. And I, but I met this guy who was just all amped up with arrogance about how – you know, how smart he was and he was going to be, you know, working on these derivatives and all this kind of crap after he got out. And I said, you know, that's interesting. Do you, do you know, uh, black Scholes formula, which is what's used for options pricing and pretty much every financial transaction on earth can be mapped in the black Scholes, unfortunately. But he's like, yeah, yeah, I studied black Scholes. And I said, you know, um, there's, so black Scholes is a formula. Let's, let's just say that every Greek is effectively a coefficient for some kind of part of the formula. And I said, what's the, what's the Greek for 
liquidity. And he looked at me and was like, what do you mean? I said, well, you have these coefficients for everything, right? Well, what's the, what's the one for uh, liquidity in a market? And he said, he just thought about it a minute. It's like short-circuited almost. And he's like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there is one. It's like, yeah, exactly. It doesn't model reality. And so, you know, you're already studying garbage, right? And so the, you know, the whole bankster system needs to create fake volume, fake liquidity or whatever you want to call it, making markets, right? In order to even make a mathematical function approximate what actually happens in reality. And this guy didn't even know that. And he's talking about, you know, using this formula to create derivatives and whatnot. And so this, this is what, where we are in the sense that even people who are ostensibly, you know, cream of the crop, whatever that means, um, going to, you know, really big name schools, which I don't want to mention, but they sound like Wharton. And they, um, you know, and they think that they really got the, uh, you know, the, the ball by the, by the horns and they really are just fed garbage pseudoscience. You know, it's, it's kind of... <laughs> It's kind of a bummer to see, and that's why it just gives me that much more motivation to think that the next system really is – there's no, there's no saving. The, the existing one just doesn't even work for us anymore. We need, to, we need to forget about the people. But however, I do – what you said dials me back into realizing that we shouldn't forget it altogether because we can use the language and the words of, these, of the old system in a way to actually activate people. Mm. Well, I- <sighs> Who who was it that accused me of something? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a rap artist named Luca. <laughs> he should have called himself Loser because it was more appropriate name for this piece of trash. <laughs> but he, he was like telling me that, uh, 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 accusing me of being some kind of a paid shill. Is like it's not a it's not an accident that Vinny's gotten so popular. You know, <laughs> it's like of course it's not an accident. Look at how awesome I am. Loser! <laughs> you know? Look at how hard I work. Um, but, but the, the element here, um, that I found very interesting is that even people within the truth movement fight with other people within the truth movement. You know, you cannot avoid it. There's always infighting. There's always arguing. There's always yeah. these, these people who say that they're awake that are, that are simply and patently, obviously incapable of thought. You know, I actually discovered this phenomena in the 80s being an open source author. It, so apparently it sort of maps into a lot of different systems. And, and in fact, in the open source community, you'll find that for any one piece of software, there's probably, you know, three or four or 20 different, different applications that do fairly similar things, none of which were finished to 100%, of course. Um, and that's one of the problems of that. But then within the community, they're all firing bullets at each other. And um, I came to the conclusion that it's probably not a good idea to fire at people in neighboring foxholes. You know, when there's a war on, I'm thinking the guy next to you might be a better friend than an enemy. And I think that, you know, we really need to get that message out to activists uh, as well as open source people that, you know, not everyone has to think exactly alike. In fact, it's probably a good thing that we don't. But, you know, you might want to look at the big picture, you know, before go fighting with each other. And I think, I mean, how fun must that be for the establishment, though? You know, they're out there, you know, jazzing people with all kinds of, you know, shills and whatnot, trolls. And I almost wonder, do they even need to, right? You know, in some ways, people kind of troll each other. <laughs> so, by the way, uh, I've got a whole bunch of other kind of topics that are sort of interesting to me that I think really aren't being talked about um, we still have many, but but I wanted to uh, quickly add an interjection before we go into that because uh, you know what you said just reminded me of. There's an episode of Family Guy where uh, uh, what was it? Uh, the Griffins get accused by their neighbors of being uh, of uh, of Stewie Griffin being a, a crack baby, right? So social services takes them, puts them in another home, and it's a home where they have like five other unwanted children, and they're all of different races and cultures and and, and what have you, okay? <laughs> And they like want Stewie to join them, and they go, Stewie, come complete our rainbow. You know, they're like they're all lying in a rainbow shape on the, on the thing. And he goes, I have a better idea. Why don't we play swallow the stuff under the sink? And it, and towards the end of it, Stewie realizes that he can actually become the most powerful child in the house by getting 
all of these kids who are of different races and cultures to fight with each other. And at the yep. very end, he's being carried away in, uh, by his dad um, to, to go home for real. And all these kids are fighting each other. And as he's being carried away, he shrieks out, dance, puppets, dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, that's, that's kind of how it, how it is when you get to... Uh, the wrong crew of people, and you know, they actually that kind of does dial into a, a topic of a, a favorite topic of mine, and that is that um, you know, we, we have all these things like LinkedIn, and you know, obviously Twitter, Facebook, and all these millions of social networking tools. You know what the world really needs, and this is just a, um, absolutely a critical piece, I think, of tomorrow's cryptocurrency is a credibility network. We need a way that we can have like a tapestry of of people on it that can assess other people and you only can assess so many people so that people don't just, you know, do the LinkedIn thing where you have like 500 people or a thousand and you have no idea, you can't remember who these people are. But the way that you really know who somebody is and you're, Vinny Eastwood's willing to vouch for, you know, Guy X and if Guy X turns out to be a real, you know, crap head then, but, by the way, you lose credibility too, right? So, if we had something like that, then when it comes to events, uh, it comes to when you're blogging online, to finding out who's, if someone real or not, you know, if you want to um, assess. It's sort of like Yelp. I do you have Yelp in New Zealand uh, for restaurants? Uh, no. Okay. Well, anyway, it's a restaurant ra- uh, crowdsource restaurant rating service. And it actually, despite all the fraud that goes on, it, it actually kind of has error correction built in, and it works. It works pretty well. If we had that kind of service for people, then you could actually bolt that on to all these chat rooms and blogs, and you could build an app so you could find out who's at some kind of a mixer or some kind of an activist event. And you could really screen out not only stooges, but you could just screen out people that aren't really stooges, but they're just kind of douchebags. Well, you know, you can you, you can never fully keep infiltrators out, and that's what the uh, the quote unquote Illuminati are famous for. It's uh, infiltrating. You know, I mean, that's why they call them traitors. Because <laughs> they're infiltrator. Well, I think the key is. I mean, obviously, that's the. There's no perfect solution. I think the key is to have a system where. Oh, by uh, the way, go ahead. I have a cunning solution for how to not lose credibility. Okay. Never claim to have any. <laughs> That's a good place to start, right? Then you can't lose it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, by, by claiming that, you would probably gain credibility, though. Exactly. Which is why <laughs> it is an incredibly cunning solution. I think that explains your show. Yeah. <laughs> you, can not, you can not only never lose credibility, um, but you can never not gain it either. <laughs> <laughs> have you kept track of any of these alternative, uh, you know, I call them social economic models like uh, Venus Project and Zeitgeist. and I, I was involved in, in, in its inception uh, when Zeitgeist 3 screened in Auckland. No, no, sorry, sorry, Zeitgeist 2. I was the only person allowed into the, into the theater without purchasing a ticket because I'm Vinnie frickin' Eastwood. <laughs> that, that's something, man. Yeah. That's, Even that's the organizers awesome. had to pay. <laughs> there's got to be perks man that's that's kind of interesting what do you think about zeitgeist anything that says we need a system for everybody rather than saying um actually bro you personally need to take responsibility for your own life and go out and solve problems yourself the way you see fit in walking with spiritual awareness and doing god's work Basically, anything that says anything other than that, not terribly interested in, to be honest. That's a good way to look at it. I, I kind of feel the same a lot. I mean, Venus Project and Zeitgeist, to me, are, um, have a lot of good ideas. And I, because I have the philosophy of not you know, shooting people in the next foxhole, I, 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 I never say anything bad. I, I feel like a little bit they, they have a, uh, a direction that's pointed toward a sort of a scientific dictatorship. But at the end of the day, just like you said, inspiring people for uh, responsibility and new ideas is, is, is a good thing. In fact, actually, someone recently said, you know, I, I have all these ideas and I'm presenting to people and they said, well, that sounds like socialism. And, and to be honest with you, it probably sounds more like anarchism. But unfortunately, people can't 
uh, pattern match properly. And so they, so I said, no, it's not anything to do with socialism. It's probably the opposite. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you think about it. Anarchism is freedom de- derived from personal responsibility. And socialism is just give up your freedom and personal responsibility and hope someone maintain, you know, to a few elite people and hope they deal with it responsibly. And that's yeah, not going to happen. Th- hope that somebody else can run my life better than I can. Yeah. Like, how the heck is that the same? I don't get that. But anyway. Why do people uh, go out and protest in favor of socialism? What the hell? <laughs> I mean, if I give up everything, you'll protect me. That's that's gonna happen, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, how's that working out for you for for your protester who's getting pepper sprayed for absolutely no reason? You know, as how how how's authoritarianism working out for you? And you're protesting in favour of it in the meantime, while you're dealing with the consequences of supporting it in the first place. I'm sorry I got in your eyes, but we have to protect the public. Uh, yeah, you know, it's the- for your protection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, oh my god, I feel so protected now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the handcuffs too. You know, oh, the, my um, my wrists were feeling all soft and supple and stuff, and this is much better. This is much better. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we prevented a thought felony. You know, the um, today actually was um, in South election, they, uh, South Africa, they had the elections, um, and the Ubuntu party was running um, uh, in that, that election. So it's kind of interesting. They're another one of these alternative models, if you know Michael Tellinger, maybe. Yeah, I, I've or, had uh, Michael on the show a number of times, yeah. Yeah, fantastic guy. I, he really is, he's just a really articulate guy, you know. And again, it's a set of ideas, and you don't have to buy into all of them. It's just great that people are thinking about responsibility and actually contributing instead of extracting. Um, and uh, he seems to be friends with another model, which is the New Earth Project or New Earth Nation, as they are, seem to be transitioning to, uh, with Sasha Stone. Have you have you talked to him? No, no, I don't think so. It's probably be a great – if he'll get on the show, it would be a great um, guest. Well, do you, do you know him? Can you hook me up, brother? I don't know him. I'll, tell, I'll ask Michael to get a hold of him because he – I, I got to say, I mean, I digest a lot of content. I think that Sasha Stone is probably one of the most articulate humans I've ever heard in my life. That guy is just brilliant, man. Man after my own heart. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, someone – it's interesting because he – He's so articulate and he's so, you know, connected on all kinds of levels, whether it's spiritual or just reality, whatever. Someone tried to pin him with that. You know, you sound like a guru. And I really loved his response. He said, bah, I'm a guru slayer. We don't like gurus around here. We think for ourselves. That's, you know, that's a man, a man of my own kind. Um, but, you know, th- those are sort of some of the projects that I've seen. And I got I'd say that I, I think the North Project and the Ubuntu guys are probably a little closer to aligned to what I have in mind in the sense that, you know, they don't propose, like with the Venus Project, they seem to want to, you know, put sensors everywhere on the Earth and pipe all that information into centralized computer grid, you know, run by smart people. And uh, don't worry, they're smarter than us, so they'll run all the sensors and allocate resources and stuff like that. And until... You know, in my mind, I think centralization and its ugly cousin uh, intermediation are some of the worst possible, you know, sort of attack vectors for corruption. By the way, Kevin, can you name me a single society throughout the entirety of history that used centralization as its, uh, you know, structural organism, whatever, that doesn't wind up either starving to death or being exterminated in war? Short list. <laughs> Can't think of any. Yeah, that's because they don't freaking exist. This is what centralization does. This is what hierarchy, power, and control. And this is the reason why psychopaths crave it so and always reintroduce it and repackage it every single century, even every decade now. It's in fact they're running out of game plan here. They're running out of they're running out of new tricks. They've been using the same old tricks for thousands of years, and we're suddenly starting to realise that the tricks in the first frickin' place, and they still keep using them, and people still keep frickin' falling for them. It's unbelievable. Well, here's a dilemma they have: after you've centralised everything and you run out, what do you do? I don't know. Um, who, who, who was it? I think it was uh, Ronald Reagan who said the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of everybody else's money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, there was you had this great guest, uh, Kevin Annett or Annett, how do you say yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, Annett, yeah. Annett, and 
he said something really interesting. He was uh, researching and he was reading some old, uh, you know, I don't know, religious papers or whatever. And they were saying how, I think it was, the, it was from the Jesuits, they were saying how you, they realized you have to brutalize children from zero to seven years old um, in order to beat it out of them because children just inherently do not accept hierarchy or being working slaves. That's a reality that's just not inherent in a human being. You have to brutalize them, and then on the other side, you give them goodies to kind of attract them. It's the carrot and stick thing. Yeah, well, and incidentally, it's the same way you break a horse. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, just, we're, we're coming to break now. Let's uh, hold that thought. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, at the com. This episode is sponsored by Kevin, the crowdfunding com. Back in a ticket. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, as the final segment now with Kevin Lawton from thecrowdfundingrevolution.com. You can get the book off of my website, thevinnieeastwoodshow.com. And bear in mind, if you do want to support this broadcast, uh, advertisers contribute just a, a little amount, but the bulk of the funding uh, comes from your donations and uh, subscriptions. This is listener-funded in the main, and even the people who advertise on this, <laughs> some of them don't pay very much or give me much for their for their ads, but because they're good people with independent businesses that aren't involved with the scumbaggery New World Order system that wants to wipe out and exterminate us all, I'll give it to them anyway. You know, just because. My very special guest, Kevin Lord. Well, to be back once again. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, we have, you have a... You had quite a long list of talking points. I wondered which are, which are the ones you're most interested to cover. Something juicy, something big, something nasty. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's start with with capitalism, and then let's wind our way to Burning Man. I think uh, that would be an interesting little pathway. Yeah, you know, that'd be good because I, I've actually envisioned burning some capitalists at the stake before myself. <laughs> well, we just—I went out to Burning Man this last uh, this last round, and it was quite a trip. You know, we only burned a big, giant wooden figure and a giant flying saucer-shaped structure, but you know, there could have been bankers on it. You know, the um, interesting thing we're that. yeah, <laughs> or actually, why waste the big structure on only one? Um, so there, we, we were talking a little bit before the break about, you know, how you, you essentially have to brutalize people to even make children think that, hey, this hierarchy is actually even a good thing. And really, I, I, I got to say, you know, I, as much as I've been involved in capitalism and startups and the whole bit, you know, it occurs to me, essentially, capitalism is, is a form of brutalization that just keeps going past the seven year mark all the way through most people's life. You know, like I, someone was talking recently, like, I, I want to start my own biz business, you know? And just, I was kind of joking. I said, you know, just think about the term busyness. That's the idea of capitalism, right? Get you running around so busy, not paying attention that, you know, oh, well, you got to pay your taxes. Okay, well, I'll get that done. Well, I got to get back to my work, you know, um, that you don't even have time to actually think about what you're doing, you know? And so you, you end up kind of getting wrapped up into that. And at the end of the day, what is, what is capitalism? Well, it's, you know, all about accumulating more and more capital, right? So then you ask people, okay, well, what's, what's capital? What's money? And I, I'd say what, one of my favorite questions is kind of, it's a little bit of an economic geek kind of a thing, but I love to ask people, what is money, right? What, what do you think it is? And they come up with all this textbook crap about fungibility and, you know, a, a unit accounting and all this stuff. It's nothing to do with that. I mean, if you look at the even the founder of <clears throat> some of the schools, like the Austrian School of uh, Economics, people talk about von Mises, but really his his mentor, I think the, the pronunciations of Menga or Menger, he actually stated what really what capitalism and what our v view of val value exchange is, and that is that value only lives in the minds of people. There is no such thing as a store of value or anything like that. It's just in our minds. And if that's true, then the store of value is just a store in, in each other, right? But the system's got us running around, you know, chasing these things that they print, which aren't really even money. They don't certainly store any wealth. They uh, don't represent anything other than a unit of debt, unfortunately, a usury-based debt. And so they keep people busy. And I, and I think like to extend Kevin Annett's statement about brutalizing kids till they're seven to live in hierarchy, I think we have to brutalize people until they're about 30 or 40 
to make them think that running around being busy all the time in quotes working for a living is a natural thing for a human to even do and that kind of leads to you know i always refer back to my favorite um you know buckminster fuller but he he had this great quote about you know we got to get rid of the specious notion that everyone has to earn a living and and at the end of it you know he was talking about how one person in 10,000 could come up with such a techno- technological idea that the rest of them don't even need to work. And so he, he ended with this, which I, I'd like to read quickly, which is, um, you know, uh, so we keep inventing jobs because of this false idea that everybody has to be employed at some kind of drudgery because according to Malthusian Darwinian theory, he must justify his right to exist. So we have inspectors of inspectors, and people making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. The true business of people should be go back to school and think about whatever it is they were thinking about before someone came along and told them they had to earn a living. Kevin, <laughs> it's funny you should say uh, justify your existence because that's what I do and try to try to do every day is justify my existence. The problem is, the difference is, sorry, that I'm justifying my own existence Nobody else is telling me to justify it. I think that's a good way to look at it um, because really what, what is, uh, you know, the kind of narcissistic psychopath, right? They're in some ways. By the way, by the way, I'm also a narcissist. Yeah, a little bit of that's not a bad thing. <laughs> well, not benign narcissism. Like uh, what's his name? Uh, Bruce Lee and Muhammad Ali. They were totally full of themselves. You know, I'm the best. I'm the best. Or whatever uh, they were. <laughs> they, <laughs> you, you know, it's like that's narcissism. Uh, it, it's pretty much an inability to deny your own awesomeness. Thank you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a psycho trip that would be to being around, you know, in the ring with somebody and they're like, I'm the greatest. You know? yeah. Well, see, that's, that's the problem with um, – um, Narcissist versus psychopaths is that I, I see psychopaths as my natural enemy because they have all the same characteristics that I do, except they don't have empathy. Sure, all right? that's the that's the one thing that I've got in spades that these 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 vipers, these evil scum, don't have, and that makes them my enemy and the enemy of all people. Yeah, well, that, in a way, that makes them, you know, prime violators of natural law, which is really just a mutual respect, you know, and you see it in every religion and uh, every kind of spiritual thinking, there's some kind of a yin-yang or golden rule or whatever, some kind of a thing that really spoils down the natural law, which is essentially we, you know, we have freedom by personal responsibility and, you know, kind of a mutual respect thing. And really, empathy is the missing piece that that allows people unfortunately to pop out of that model and not live within natural law well that's why so, they outlawed e um i think it was back in was it the 60s or 50s i think when they when they first invented e i forget but it was it, it didn't stand for ecstasy it stood for empathy and it was prescribed for family violence they give a violent father an e send him home to his kids He'd never lay a hand on him again. He just loves him so much. Oh my God, they're so soft. Oh my, lo- I love you so much. You can't, can't hurt him. And so they're like, oh my God, this is helping people to be empathetic and not scumbags. Illegal! <laughs> well, if you invested in Corrections Corp of America, you'd probably be happy they outlawed you know? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, 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 I joke about those kind of things but i gotta say back during the first in, uh, invasion or whatever you want to call it in, in iraq i had a friend you know and he heard, he kind of saw the war dream drums beating and so he goes out and finds some small stock where the company manufactured body bags you know and he invested in it and made a nice little pop from the war because he knew it was coming on you know and and i'm just thinking wow that's a that's a whole different mindset right there <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, you know, I have actually have a friend in, in prison these days for uh, um, allegedly selling ecstasy and maybe a few other things. Um, he uh, was, you know, the unfor- really unfortunate thing besides destroying, you know, a really nice person's life is he was kind of a community leader around a tea house. And he was just probably the most magical guy I've ever met in my life. But I guess, you know, allegedly had a few things on the side. And, you know, here's this guy who really means absolutely nothing uh, uh he, his intent is nothing other than just spreading goodness and enlightening people and making them more healthy that was really his mission in life 
And this guy is like in prison. And, it, you know, when you see that firsthand, it really, you know, it really hits you, the kind of system that we have and that we're doing everything we can to take the most high conscious people in the world and throw them in some kind of jail, you know, make money off them apparently. Um, it's a, it's pretty dismal, but you know, that's kind of where we are now. And that's, you know, just hopefully that just fires people up more to, you know, kind of pop out of the system and build something new because the old ones just broke, you know? Yeah. I, I think whistleblowers are like probably one of the, uh, the key figures to that. Like in, in the modern age, um, the ability to actually really change things and, and help people to see things with the way they really are. Whistleblowers seem to be the, uh, the people to look at, um, it kind of makes me want to cry because these people have their money, homes, family, friends, and careers disappear for defending humanity from scumbaggery. And I'm sitting here getting donations and recognition for doing the same kind of thing, but making way less sacrifice. And, and I think that's the reality uh, for which I and all of us really should be ashamed. But I, I don't really feel guilty about it because I interview whistleblowers and I help their voices be heard. Um, merely as an effort to make up for my own failings and uh, lack of self-sacrifice for the greater good. And in so doing, I believe this justifies my existence. Well, you know, on the other hand, it's hard to be an activist from inside a jail sometimes, too. So, you know, maybe it's good that you're, uh, you know, doing what you're doing. Anyway, as I understand it, you're kind of the, the alternate media guy in uh, New Zealand, right? Yeah, so, uh, well... Pen no one else has, has there's, stepped there's up. There's two so, types uh, of alternative media. Yeah. There's those who are mainstream alternative media who only really comment on mainstream media articles. And yes. then there's new media, which actually talk about the stuff exclusively that the mainstream media never talks about or sidelines or demonizes or issues, which means, unfortunately, you really have to cover everything that they, that they cover um, as well. But... Um, I don't know. It's, it's quite strange, Kevin, in the last... Shoot, how long have I been in this house? I think five months, five months. My radio in my car has been dead. I haven't listened to any mainstream talk radio. My uh, TV aerial has been dead. I haven't watched any mainstream news. And you know what's funny, Kevin? I don't mm. feel any less informed. You're probably more informed because you haven't been inundated with such garbage. Well, it's what Mark Twain said. He said, oh, no, 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 no. Was it Mark Twain or Thomas Jefferson? I think it was Jefferson, actually. He said, uh, those who only read newspapers are less informed than those who read nothing at all. And the Twain quote was, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read the newspaper, you're misinformed. Mm, that's interesting. It's I, I'm the same as you. I don't I don't do TV, and th my only newspapers is I read the headlines when they're sitting in the newspaper box, only for a, a sort of an entertainment, a dark entertainment. So I read the headlines, and I pretty much know right away what the actual story was just by the headline. But that you know I've I've been kind of reading and figuring out what's going on in the world for most of my life. So you sort of get that skill after a while. But I, I sort of don't read it the same way people do. And, and then at that, it's just the headline because the rest is garbage anyway, right? The, the headline's telling you what they're trying to, to make you think right off the bat. So um, it's just one of those things that uh, people – I've actually had I've had people I know who got out of reading newspapers because they just at some point realized, you know, I'm not getting anything out of this. And I'm just going to pop out of this. So you just cut your subscription to the newspaper and, you know, try to find some other some other sources. The only thing about that is for a lot of people, it's once you start, there's this sort of um, ceiling, right, where people hit, where you start learning stuff and then you realize, wow, there's a lot more to learn. So then you go learn that. And then it seems like, you know, for every stone you turn over, there's another 10 and it tires out a lot of people or they just don't have the wherewithal or bandwidth to do it. So then they kind of tire out and they burn out and they go back. Sometimes they slip back into the old, you know, old reality that they were stuck in before. It's an interesting dynamic to see. So I guess one of the things, though, that I found where, where it's really effective for, wake, for waking people up is this is unfortunate, but when their health goes bad. Yeah. Or, or when they get busted by the cops for no good reason. You know what's funny? Here's the irony, Kevin. The worst stuff that happens to you 
the more likely you are to wake up and realize there's something wrong. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, somebody called in my show, uh, I think it might have been um, last year or maybe maybe 2012. I, c- I can't remember the, when this happened, but they asked me, Vinny, how, how am I supposed to wake people up? I just, I just don't know how to do it. And I go, well, you could call the police and report them for a crime they didn't commit. And when the cops come, bust into their house, tear up their couches, rip their TV to pieces, shred their stereo system, and then uh, when they don't find anything, still bind them in handcuffs and then take them down to the cells with all the really (laughs) nasty criminals and uh, take their uh, shoelaces off and their belts and everything like that and then leave you in there while they make jokes about you just outside your cell and what have you while you're crying and on the floor and enjoying your suffering, etc., They'll wake up pretty freaking quickly. Or, or they will be damaged for life irreparably. Okay? Yeah. That's, the, that's the kind of thing. It's like Ebola. You know, you, you leave a person with Ebola in the hut for three days. They either come out alive or they don't come out at all. Right? <laughs> now that, my friend, is a thought grenade. <laughs> that's that, that, it's funny you should mention um, that because I've, I've been calling them information grenades. You, um, if you're arguing with somebody who, who's like, basically, you can't argue with them because they're too freaking stupid to listen or look at evidence. You, what you do is you do the information grenade. You pull the pin, you say something, and then you walk out of the room and you wait Absolutely. for it to blow up in their face later. Absolutely, yeah. Get them, get them thinking. My, my favorite thing is to tell somebody something that sounds like what they want to hear that, oh, you got to, yeah, yeah, I know something about that. Go look this up and then give them a pointer to something and then have them find out that, oh, this isn't actually what I thought it was. This is worse, right? So instead of having to tell them, then they end up finding out on their own. So Unfortunately, that's a constant realization for a lot of truthers. Man, it's a lot worse than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's an everyday occurrence, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's daily, you know, like... It- <laughs> Because uh, your understanding of how fracked up everything is gets expanded on a daily basis. <laughs> Awareness is not, is not does not set you free, ladies and gentlemen, nor does knowledge. If anything, it burdens and weighs you down for the rest of your freaking existence. My Enjoy. <laughs> favorite bumper sticker actually was, uh, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, <laughs> speaking of bumper stickers, I saw a really good one. Um, do you know about Holden's and Ford's and how there's a big kind of rivalry between these two car manufacturers and fans of them and that kind of thing? Not aware of that. No. Okay. Well, anyway, in New Zealand, all the all the police cars are Holden's, right? And I saw a Ford driving along and it had a bumper sticker saying, "Only pigs drive Holden's." <laughs> Actually, that could be kind of a marketing thing, too. <laughs> you know, did, I mentioned uh, Burning Man earlier. I, we could talk a little bit about Burning Man because that was um, – I, I hope people have had a chance to uh, go to that. And if they don't, that they, that they do in the future because it's – you really can't understand what a new system is like until you just live in it, you know, until you really get there and you spend enough time seeing other people live in a different system. And there are – you know, I think Burning Man's changing, or there's some other all the worldwide events are sort of like it. I understand, but uh, that it really changes people's perspective because you know you go there and uh, there's this huge line to get in. It takes hours to get in, and, and it's like capitalism outside the fence and <laughs> anarchy inside. You know, you, you got to go through this long line so you can get checked to make sure you paid your few hundred hour ticket. You know, <laughs> and then after the uh, capitalism ends, you get in, and it's just this. This new world of, of, of you know, people's there's no there's no commerce at all. You're not able to sell anything, so that leaves people with essentially giving out stuff. So you find you give out and you know and, and exchange with people. So what happens is instead of you know people trying to set up businesses, they actually find something they're passionate about, and they do that. You know, people set up bars and they set up. Uh, tents with yoga and tents for meditation and there's even like a TEDx uh, event at Burning Man where people talk about some pretty interesting stuff but then you know there's the there's this this nightlife of just complete anarchy that's it's like a combination it's hard to describe it's like a combination of being in a you know sort a of dance a dance club and a hippie commune yeah combined with Mad Max Oh yeah, that, that's movie. That's totally you know? right. 
it's it's um you know it's out there it's on a desert playa so there's in the wind picks up so you have these sandstorms and imagine this there's these these roads that are sort of rings and then there's spikes these spoken wheels that kind of connect as well that their roads are just made out of the just you know cordon off areas whatever and there's no directionality on the road so other than um the art cars which drive around and blast out techno music and have hot chicks on them and stuff there's really no directionality on the road so there's there's bikes and there's people walking and art cars the sandstorms are coming up it's dark and you know you see just the glow of people's lights and all kinds of stuff techno is blasting out and you're thinking, the, at some point it hit me, geez, there's no directions. There's no, like, left side and right side or whatever. And and people are kind of just careening around each other and, you know, near Missile Central all the time. But yet, generally, there's no you don't really hit anybody. And it, it just hits you at some point that, you know, maybe we don't actually need people telling us where the stop sign is and the light and the, you know, the, the dashed lines and you know, where you can pass and what the speed limit is and all this stuff. It's just, it's a place where you can go where you just pop outside rules and it's left for people to have this thing called personal responsibility. And I got to tell you, man, it, you know, there's always a couple of douches slipping here and there, but it's actually a really amazing place. And the people are, you know, maybe because they're in a different space, but, when people don't have rules, they oddly enough revert to this thing where you actually absorb some responsibility. That's well, and, and also, um, if if there's no rules and uh, they see problems um, and, and other people needing help, they're far yep. more likely to go and help them because they know that there's no actual authority that's going to help them. So if they see it, they do something. It's kind of like um, it, it's like a a, a weird. Um, uh, interpretation of the see something say something uh, campaign run by the Department of Homeland Security <laughs> <laughs> at Walmart. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think you're right. I think uh, you know, in this in the the regular world, where we, it's not really regular, but this world we live in, people sort of become immunized, and you know, will drive by someone in need, right? And you know, somebody else with a cell phone will call for help or something. But there, you're absolutely right. It's it's a different mindset. In fact, it's such a different way of living that when when people come back, there are some people who are more sensitive because they it just resonates so strongly with them that they become depressed when they get back, and they have to go through Burning Man decompression uh, events to sort of ease their way back into this capitalist or capitalist society we live in. And it's kind of interesting. It's a little easier for me for whatever reason. I guess I'm just sort of an observationalist, but um, they literally, people, it affects them deeply because they realize the rest of their life sucks. And, you know, and then they go there and they feel at, at home. It, it, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm, it's at night and I'm, I'm riding my bike around and I'm trying to like, you know, careen around people and not hit people or get deafened by all the techno music playing and stuff. And, and uh, I get kind of so, you know, into the, it's like you, you fall back into your pattern of like, you know, kind of stressing and trying to get somewhere fast. And this guy comes biking by and he's so happy and he goes, wow, man, have a good burning, man, you know. And I realized, you know, I'm bringing my tension there. You know, I'm, I'm riding around and, and for that moment, maybe I'm kind of the douche, you know. You know, people are trying to have a good vibe, and here I am bringing my kind of city esque vibe in there. You know, and it, you 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 sort of you lose that quickly, but it it takes a little bit for the the walls to to kind of drop down. And win in Rome, absolutely, man. It's uh, so I can see when the you know you've got these whether it's the zeitgeist or the Ubuntu or the New Earth Nation people. You know, they really they really have their finger on something, on creating something completely new where. It's a balance of responsibility and, you know, contribution. Is it because it happens? I mean, people go out there and, you know, you 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 talked about. I think maybe it was before the the call started officially, but you, you know, crowdfunding and you know, so to some extent, people can have a feeling like being a mooch. I mean, you could literally be a professional mooch out there. You could go with nothing, and there's so many people giving out stuff. You could mooch out there. But even that, with that dynamic, it almost doesn't matter because there are so many people giving their passion out. They just, people want a chance to actually give something out. It's really strange. I mean, you get, you know, you'd think people are trying to save all their money in capitalism and, you know, 
pinch pennies or whatever. And then they'll go and just blow a fortune making these amazing camps and buildings and everything that people just fundamentally want to give if we were allowed a system where that, that could flourish. Or if they have any money left over after the government taxes the remaining spare cash. Now, <laughs> Kevin Lawson has been my very special guest. This has been a very, very quick interview. His website is thecrowdfundingrevolution.com and there is the crowdfunding revolution book banner on the homepage of the Vinnie East. Just another reminder, yet again, this is a predominantly listener-supported broadcast, so please go to the homepage and subscribe today. A little regular donations are actually really good because it means I don't have to constantly beg uh, for donations, especially towards the ends of particular periods where a whole lot of bills all come in at once. Have you ever noticed that, ladies and gentlemen, that whenever you think you've got spare money and you check your letterbox, it's a bad move, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay kevin thank you very much for your time it's been an honor man love being on your show and thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for listening we'll see you again next time 